Hey guys, Armageddon here today, and I bust out all my German guns for you guys. Got them all up on the wall here, so we can do a rundown of the last hundred years of German small arm history. Should be a fun topic. We're not going to go into crazy detail on things, but I'm going to give you guys a good general idea of how we went from one weapon system to another, and one era to another, and kind of just some notable things around the way. Of course, I'll identify each firearm and give you a couple fun characteristics for each. We'll also go through the calibers. I have all of those things laid out right here, all the notable ones that we'll be talking about today. We'll get to why that's there in a second. Actually, that second is right now. Guys, pop up the camera. There are two guns in this picture that don't belong. Hit up the comments below and like, ignore that down there. It's meant to be over here. Whatever doesn't belong, hit that up in the comments below if you can name it. And that's time. Jump back in. We'll talk about those things in another couple seconds. I want to run through the room really quickly here. I'm super excited because I got a new safe in from Rhino Metals. Pop this guy open, this thing is huge. It's actually the same size as uh, this old girl right here, but this one's gonna be for all the naughty guns. Got a couple Thompsons in here. It's, uh, I have to deck it out. I have to figure out how we're gonna organize this thing efficiently, but we're gonna do it. It's gonna be a fun video when it's done. So I'll go through how this gun, the safe gets set up and the purpose behind that another day here. Otherwise, the rest of the room is going to get decked out with more Gallo Tech real soon. So this whole wall is going to look just as good, if not better, than this wall over here. Pretty excited about that. Anyways, guys, back to the task at hand, the guns that don't belong. So we have down here the Maud Deuce, which is basically straight out of Americana and does not belong in this German wall of guns. So that's basically here though, because it's really heavy and the spot always looks empty and wrong without it. So there it stays. And then of course in the corner, if you got it, that's a World War II 20 mil anti-tank gun from Finland, the Lottie L39. So <laughs> the reason that's there, much like the Modus, it's freaking heavy. It's over 110 pounds and it, you know, it's not hurting me, so I'm just, I'm, it might if I move it, so I'm just gonna leave it there. But uh, for quick reference here, this is 20 mil, and this is 50 BMG. And these are the other calibers we're talking about here. Nine, like, these are absolutely massive, and I really need to shoot this thing one day. So if you can't wait, go uh, check out Ian at Forgotten Weapons or Richard Ryan. They've got some cool content shooting one of those big beasts. Anyways, the actual content of today, German small arms history. So where else should we start than but at the beginning with the K98K. This thing was Germany's primary arm in both World War I and II. This particular one was actually made in 1943 and it probably wasn't even issued for service in World War II, but that's okay. We can also note the post-war Czech winter trigger guard, which is kind of a neat little thing there, but just a beautiful firearm. There were so many of those things made. This thing was such an impressive and notable action in bolt gun history. This action is just, it's world renowned and it's influenced a ton of designs ever since. Honestly, the biggest development following this is probably the fix by Q, but we'll talk about that soon enough. Anyways, guys, that is chambered in eight mil as are these next two big beauties, the MG34 and the MG42. So guys, following World War I, well, most of the world was pretty ticked off at Germany for trying to invade it. So Germany wasn't supposed to be messing around with any guns. What did Germany do? They messed around with some guns and they came up with one heck of one and a whole new class of firearm, the general purpose machine gun. Now the MG34 is probably you know, renowned as being the first good example of an, a general purpose machine gun. That's a machine gun that the military can use they can take one gun and fill a ton of rolls with it. They can do medium machine gun rolls, light machine gun rolls, and put it inside vehicles. Like this thing was really versatile. And ironically, Germans kind of did this in World War I as well with the MG08-15. If you guys don't know what that gun is, Google it really quickly. It looks, it, you, you might laugh. Like it literally looks at the type of guns that we drew as kids when we were six years old. Like it's. It's, it's an ugly duckling and it's pretty steampunk too. It's kind of actually, it's kind of cool in that regard, but uh, it kind of paved the way and Germany really built on the lessons learned with that gun and applied them to the MG34. However, there was a problem 
And this problem existed with most interwar, that's between World War I and World War II, firearm designs, is they were all just too damn fancy for their own good. They were all made, like submachine guns, rifles, and light machine guns all fell victim to this. They were just made so well. They're usually indicative of a lot of fancy machining and that requires good alloy steel. They just take a lot of time to produce and that leads to money and fewer production. So Germany realized pretty quickly, we gotta kick this up like three notches. So they explored stamping, which then gives you the MG42. Now the MG42 is actually one of the first large scale examples of a stamped firearm being fielded by a military. And that's, well, stamped guns are very common nowadays. You think of like the MP5, which we'll, we'll get to that, and the AK-47, but those are both post-war designs. This was very unusual for the time. Again, they're used to building stuff like this, really fancy, meticulously milled, machined to this, which is kind of, again, you have to be pretty careful with stampings too. There's a lot of tight tolerances to hold, but this is way faster, way cheaper. You can use way lower grade of steel with this kind of stuff, and you can just crank these things out. So they did that, but their doctrine had already been built around this gun, and because of that, they couldn't just eliminate this. This was still widely used inside tanks. Because of the way you change the barrels on these things, it wasn't really ideal to switch and use the MG42 and things like that. But the MG42 definitely had some perks as well. A super high fire rate, like 1,500 rounds per minute. It was just wild. So that had a lot of bonuses for light infantry units, like machine gun nests and anti-air applications. So pretty cool stuff. Ironically, this gun is actually made in 1943. It's pretty early for a 42. And uh, this gun here is made end of the war, 1945 for an MG-34. So it's kind of cool. They both still were produced and reused by the military all throughout World War II. Um, the other thing is the MG-42 was actually derived in 1939. So Germans were pretty on top of stuff and they realized they needed that pretty darn early. Anyways, that's plenty of time for World War I and World War II. Swooping up next into the Cold War, which pretty much kicked off shortly after World War II ended. We're gonna focus on the Western side of things, not the East Germany, because I don't really have much to talk about there. They got taken over, they used AKs, end of story. On the West side, they actually kicked things off with the FN, FAL, otherwise known as the right arm of the free world. Now, again, Germany, people weren't super thrilled with it because once again, like World War I, they kind of tried to invade everybody, so people weren't super trustworthy of them with guns and Germany really wanted to make their own small arm at home. They wanted a license to make FN FALs at home. Belgium would not grant it, so they said, heck with that, we're gonna go with this SEPI rifle we've been working on with the Spaniards, bring that back home as the G3. They looked at the G2 as well, that was the Swiss 510, but they uh, ultimately landed on this SEPI rifle that HK actually helped develop. So, roller lock is back in, and it's back in hard. The MG42 actually made early use of a roller locking system. It's kind of cool. There's some interesting history there that I'll talk about when we do a deep dive on the 42. But suffice to say, Germany was well into the battle rifle phase of its small arm history. And a lot of the Western powers went to this. They ditched bolt guns in favor of semi-automatic and actually fully automatic full power rifles. They settled on the 7.62 NATO and the 5.56 NATO rounds, but the, the most of them started off with big battle rifles like this. Select fire, capable of full auto, and they generally had 20 round mags and a 30 caliber cartridge. And that gun in full auto would rock your socks off, literally. And most countries that adopted these, well, at least ones that adopted the FALs, had them converted to semi-automatic only. Because two things, they weren't very controllable in full auto, uh, and troops tended to waste a lot of ammunition with them. So you just, you wouldn't hit anything and you'd blow through your ammo too fast. But they did make good, you know, designated marksman style, you know, semi-automatic rifles. So they, they kept them like that for quite a while and they still ran their subguns. And then through numerous engagements, they started seeing that, you know, these Soviets with their AK-47s, that's more of an intermediate cartridge. And they're really kicking some butt with, with these things. I know the Israelis had some face-offs with them, with their fouls, and they decided that, you know what, 7.62 NATO is just too much. We need to go with something a little bit smaller. So the 5.56 era, kind of kick things off. And that's where we have, well, the big brother to this gun. This is an HK-53, but the HK-33 is just a scaled down version of the G3 to 5.56. And then they wanted shorter versions as well for different units. So there was the G33K, and then ultimately they wanted to start replacing the submachine gun 
for some units with the full auto intermediate caliber rifle. And that's where guns like the AK 74U came in, the little crink, and guns like this, the HK 53 with a super short, this, for a time, this was the shortest barrel gun you could get in the Western powers that was actually reliable and could run a 5.56 well. Now the 53 had some issues of its own, but widely it was pretty, pretty solid gun. And from personal experience, this thing kicks ass and it's one of the favorites that I have access to currently. Again, we're chambered in 5.56. Down from there, nine mil, that's actually the MP5. And fun fact, this thing is so much like an MP5, it's crazy. Literally, MP5, 9 mil, they just stretch it to 5.56. So much else on the gun is the same. The handguard, the buttstock are literally interchangeable with an MP5, so pretty cool stuff. And you can see again, heavy use of stampings throughout carrying down the line from what the MG42 kind of paved the way with. So fun stuff. Anyways, after the roller lock revolution, we kicked off into the era of fantastic plastic. So we have the G36. Now they've brought in a gas system once again. There's a little short stroke gas piston system in here, very much like the AR-18, which didn't really do much except for influence a whole bunch of other guns. And the G36 is pretty cool. Now, this is a G36K. There's also a full size. And then again, the G36C, which is kind of the modernized version of the 53. The submachine gun counterpart, which is the UMP, the universal machine pistol, was targeted at law enforcement. Now this if pulled off correctly, is far simpler to manufacture and cheaper than all these stampings, which require, again, precision work, a bunch of welding, but a bunch of skill trades where they can just mold this receiver and then chuck some parts in it and call her a day. And literally the UMP, this came on three calibers, nine mil, 40 Smith and Wesson and 45 ACP. And they all use the same receiver. You can just chuck out the bolt barrel and mag and <laughs> run your ump in the flavor of your choice. And guys, from here we get into the modern day where Germany takes a serious look at the M16 platform. And a little help from Larry Vickers, they come up with the 416. Now this is a civilian roll-marked MR223. This is the A3 version, which would be comparable to the 416A5, but literally there is very little difference here, except for the fact that this is a semi-automatic only. That color, by the way, which is affectionately referred to by HK fans as baby poop, is called RAL8000. You'll see it up here again as well on the G28, which we'll talk about in just a second. So they got the 416, which once again, we're chambered in 5.56. Guys are still wanting the big row, the 30 cal counterpart. So 416 meet 417. And that's what that guy is. Again, semi-automatic, but it's still 417, which is freaking cool. And then we got the undermount GLM, the XM320. That little guy is chambered in this rubber, foam rubber, 40 mil. Uh, so high explosive rounds. I don't have any access to those right now. Those are illegal. And I, again, I, I'm not licensed for those, but I can have chalk rounds and these little foam rubber, less lethal ones. Still would not want to get shot with one of them. I got a video shooting one of these things at a cardboard box. It's been pretty popular. I don't know if you've seen it or not. <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> that box did not have a good time. I would not want to get shot inside 100 feet with that thing if my life depended on it because it, it could so anyways the 417 is also adapted into a semi-automatic designated marksman rifle the g28 and actually the g28 is built on the civilian pattern of 417 the mr308 because it was designed to be a semi-automatic platform from the get-go and uh, just capable of greater accuracy and incredible durability this actually has a steel upper receiver ar-15s use aluminum receivers this upper is steel and it weighs a frick ton. And the US military would actually go on to adopt a version of this without the steel receiver as the new M110A1 CSAS, which is replacing the Knight's M110 SASS rifle in a number of roles. Anyways, guys, that's gonna be pretty much wrap up my video for today. I've also got a couple pistols on the wall here. Again, just kicking things off early in the development with super complicated, very expensive, but very cool. The P7 squeeze cocker, that thing is a favorite of mine. Some people hate it, but I, I definitely love it. There's actually a delayed piston blowback system in here, which is really cool. And then your mod, I don't know if it's USP, I'm definitely missing that, as well as like a P38 or a Luger from, from the original old days, but we've got a modern one here, the SFP9, as it's known in Canada and Europe, and the VP9, as it's known in the States. 
Anyways, my dudes and dudettes, I hope you guys enjoyed the content. Stay tuned for a lot more fun real soon. And fun fact, apparently Glock is making an assault rifle. Guys, catch you in the next one. Arm and gun, out. Also, definitely check me out on Instagram at arm.and.gun. I'll love you forever. And for all you guys who are still kicking around, I appreciate you, and so does AccuTac. I'm running a giveaway for these guys right now, but they chucked out a discount code for a whopping 25%. Code Arm and Gun at checkout will save you 25%. So pretty stoked about that. I've been using these things for a couple years, and I swear by them, so I'm just happy to be able to offer that to you guys as well. Big thanks to AccuTac. Check out my links in the description below for other cool companies that I do collabs with and that have given me discount codes. You might find something you like and you'll save some money at it as well. Thanks a ton, guys. Catch you on the next one.